Seven years ago, six years ago, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I knew about it from his work as a PhD student with Jen Rexford and, um, uh, at Princeton. And uh, after that, he was working at um, what's now Microsoft Azure in the networking team when they were trying to figure out their approach to networking. And at the time, we were interested in network virtualization as well. And uh, so I found very curious to hear what this. Uh, well, this, this, this alternative view, it's turned out to be very, very credible to use throughout uh, Microsoft. So it's been very, very influential as a network architect. And uh, I've been working very closely with Chang over the last couple of years on this thing before and programmable data planes. So he is very, very involved leading the p4.org effort on this p4 language. And uh, so it's been a, a very special to work with him. So I think it's going to be an interesting talk. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Okay. So I uh, work for Barefoot Networks, but I also work uh, very actively with the people language consortium, people.org. Um, so I'm, today I'm representing uh, mostly people.org. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about much about the Barefoot Networks themselves. <coughs> so <coughs> imagine that you're building a networking system today. Uh, you may have some choices. You have merchant silicon. You can, if you're working for some large company, system companies, you may have some in-house silicon developed by your engineers. But either way, um, it's fixed function ASIC. And uh, therefore, you have to figure out if, if you're the software team of this networking system group, then you have to figure out roughly how this fixed function ASIC actually works. What kind of functions it has, and what kind of APIs do I have to call how to enable these functions? Uh, so that's done first. And then you write your own you know, software, routing protocol daemon, or you know, any applications that run in this system, on this system. And then that system at runtime uh, communicate with this chip through the API and driver. So that's the common way of building a system. Two characteristic points here, uh, this way, Right. Figuring out how this actually this chip works is uh, done in human language and hence can be very ambiguous. Um, and then this is fixed function. So this leads to lots of problems. Um, first of all, this can be very prone to bugs because misunderstanding typically leads to bugs. Right. Um, and then um, it also has a uh, it suffers from very long and unpredictable lead time. Any new features, new ideas that you want to realize, you have to wait for the next chip. And if the ideas do not come into the chip, then you're out of luck. You have to wait maybe another three, four years praying for that. So what kind of new ideas am I talking about? There is a bunch. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but let's start with some fairly obvious and yet almost impossible things to do today. Say. Um, if you suppose you own your own network, you might probably want to allocate your, you know, chip hardware resources, routing tables, or you know, uh, buffer memory, any any physical resources in your network data plane. You might want to allocate those resources adaptively and then change the allocation dynamically at runtime. For example, you started with this kind of allocation, this size of routing, L2 forwarding table, L3 forwarding table, echo. But like any network, real networks keep changing. Their architecture changes, and that the address assignment policies change, security policies keep changing. So you you might want to revisit this sometime, right? Hey, I, it turns out that I'm I'm not using L2 much at all. I'm very very L3 heavy, and then all of a sudden I have a huge amount of IPv6 prefixes that I'll have to maintain. I thought that the you know, migration. Uh, requirement for the IP address prefixes was low, but it turns out that it's very high for whatever reasons. Things change. So you might naturally want to change the allocation of these physical resources at runtime. Today, that's impossible. Right? And also for some devices, say imagine data center network, a lot of echoes are done at the top of rec switch level and then spines essentially do not do any echoing. So why do I even need to burn this physical space, expensive TCAM resources to you know, reserve an echo space that I don't even need. Why can't I just get rid of that and then use it for something else? Or this is again my network. Why can't I ensure full visibility at my on my own? Why can't I, for example, 
uh, we construct a, an entire time series of chewing latency at the packet level from this particular device where I'm suspecting that in-cast problem is happening frequently. Why can I run, for example, full mesh tour to tour um, you know, connectivity protocols, say you know, one million pairs of them, and then let each one of these ping all the other tours every millisecond, and then immediately I see the you know, reachability problem. Right? Why can I do all these you know, obvious things? Right? Yes. So, if, if you look at existing yep. switches, you can often do many of these things yep. at the chip driver level, yep. but it's specific to that chip, which is a really irritating problem. Yep. You know, like Fulcrum hardware, I know how to do, like, yep. you know, from dynamically real life. Yep. So it'll work on that hardware. Yep. Yeah, some of these are configurable, but I wouldn't say they're entirely programmable. Yeah, and also, as you said, you have to speak a completely different language, not even language, but configuration knobs, right? So that's very irritating. A lot of other, you know, cool ideas, uh, the new encapsulation, new standard protocols, network fabric load balancing, new congestion control, um, new data plane recovery, fast failover. I'm not going to go through one of each one of these because I'm going to revisit this. But in summary, what happened to your NSDI CCOM or hotnet papers after publication? Right. A lot of them are realizable because it's realizable through software changes, but also, a lot of them need hardware changes. And where are they? Right. So we want to see them happening in real world as soon as possible. And that's our goal. But we all know that there is extremely limited way of turning those ideas into reality today, uh, essentially because there is no DIY. Right? You, you have to work with vendors at the feature level. I mean, it's understandable. Nobody can do everything on its own. But working at the feature level is a very serious problem here. Because um, to define the feature requirement, you have to go through a very elaborate and you know, actually very painful process to either standardize the feature as well as to motivate this you know, or give economic incentives to the vendors so that they can actually realize these features. Right? That's very, very tough job, especially in a multi retail session. Even if you convince some vendors, you have to wait years. Right? And then suppose you wait it, then you have to buy new, new systems. You can't just upgrade their operating system and enjoy these features. They're almost always bundled with new system, and so you have to, again, spend fortune to be able to enjoy that feature. And worse yet, most of the time, the thing that you ask for is somewhat slightly but very meaningfully different from what is actually delivered in front of you. Because the vendor does not work only for you. They work for everybody, and then they listen to everybody, and then end up coming up with something that doesn't work for anybody. So our goal is in to entirely change this feature. And we know that programmable data plane can solve this problem. It's not Panacea, but it can solve a lot of this problem. And in fact, there are some programmable devices out there. So of course, general purpose CPUs, but it works only at some tens of gigabps of ranges today. And FPGAs, NPUs, great. Some people actually use these to build real systems, but again, works only at up to hundreds of gigabps. And if you have to build multi terabps system, you have to buy many of those things, and then it becomes a little too expensive or uh, power hungry. <coughs> But the most notable techni technological advance that we're observing right now happening in the industry is this thing called uh, protocol independent switch architecture, also known as PISA. This is essentially a multi terabps uh, multi-chain silicon with fully programmable parsing capability and very generic match action logic. And uh, we have seen a few evidences here. RMT paper was published at CCOM, uh, reviewed the architecture was reviewed by you know the research prominent research groups and that they a lot of them write like the architecture and then a um, couple companies are actually trying to build this kind of silicon right. and so i personally believe that this kind of silicon will be the dominant um, architecture we become the dominant architecture in a few years so why why does this matter because now we have full coverage of programmability. Right? From the lower end, tens of gigabps, 
to multi-tier VPS. So this entire speed spectrum is now covered by programmable targets. So what happens then? If you have this kind of programmable targets, this entirely changes the picture, turns the table completely. So now you, as the system designer and owner, you dictate the way these packets are actually forwarded in the data plane. So you have to do this first. You couldn't do this before. And then your you know, applications run the same way. So now you need to dictate this, this mechanism. And then you cannot use ambiguous human language. You need a machine language. That's why P4 kicks in. And, um, and we're, we're going to talk about this architecture and P4 today. So, um, and this is one slide summary of all the benefits. So, <coughs> a teaser for the entire talk. So, what does this mean? This data plane programmability mean to different, you know, uh, groups of people? Suppose you're um, engineers or architects working at uh, large system companies. You you want to build large network devices. Then it means you can actually use software programming practices and tools used in you know, every phase of your development and testing. You can copy what you've been doing in the software industry, and then you can put that practice into the hardware industry. And therefore, you can do extremely fast feature iteration and uh, feature releases as well. Even if you use Merchant Silicon, now you can differentiate yourself from your competition because you realize your data plane ideas using your own P4 program, and then you don't necessarily need to share it with your competition. And moreover, you can even fix some data plane bugs in, in, in the field, because a lot of data plane logic is actually realized in, in a program, P4 program. So it's a matter of changing the P4 program, testing it, and then re-releasing it. If you are... Um, a large online service provider or a carrier, it also means a lot of benefits. First of all, these white boxes that you've heard about, right? Merchant Silicon running their own or you know, owner's own operating system is typically called white box, but it has a big black box in the data plane today. Nobody knows how exactly this black box chip works. Now, you don't need to worry about that you know, lack of transparency in the data plane. Typically, these large online service providers are going to have a large group of very good programmers, developers. So you can use them, and then they can actually help you by programming, testing, and debugging all the network devices that you have. And then most importantly, you can keep your own ideas. Your own data plane designs are retained in your organization. And so you can keep improving it over time. And uh, if you're a researcher or grad student, you wear both hats, partially. Right? So these benefits all belong to you now. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about the high-level summary of the PISA architecture. And then um, give a thought on, uh, or share some thought on why we call this protocol independent forwarding and why we need P4 language, what, what it does. And then I'm also going to give you some examples of the cool new applications that we can enable using this data plane programmability. And finally, I'm also going to share some research problems that I see uh, arising on the horizon. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the nature of the language? Uh, for example, like well, this, how, yeah. Just, just how it's structured. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. I, I, yeah, I'll show you a preview of the language. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with the architecture, the high-level overview of the piece architecture, and then I'll give you a summary of the language itself. So this is right, essentially an architecture optimized for high-speed programmable packet forwarding. So um, essentially, this is there are two components here: fully programmable packet parser, which receives byte streams from the input input ports, and then there is a sequence of match action. Uh, stages okay so and then in each match action stage you have a bunch of these uh, match action units the very generic match and action cap action execution capability in parallel so why do we have multiple stages and multiple units in each stage because the things that have to be serially organized like some read write operations that have 
dependencies, you need multiple, you know, sequential execution logic, right? So you handle that through these uh, multiple stages of pipeline. And each pipeline, there are multiple parallelizable tasks, match and action, action tasks. So we observe or meet those parallelization requests through this, uh, by having multiple units of MA match action units. So packet arrives, a packet arrives here and it gets parsed the, by the programmable parser and then the parsed representation, essentially a set of or a collection of containers holding <coughs> packet header fields, arrive at the first stage and then the first stage uses some of these to extract match key and then based on the match result, it actually performs the corresponding actions and then uh, by doing so, it may, the first stage may actually end up creating new set of uh, containers or change the, the contents in the existing containers. Right? So this set of containers keep traveling through this pipeline and then every stage you do some, some match action uh, operations. And then when it arrives at the last stage, it gets reassembled, also known as uh, get uh, deparsed. And then this uh, you know, sequence of uh, bytes, basically the, the packets again, travel outside. To make this a little more realistic, we need um, a pair of this, right? So on the ingress side, you have some match action sequence or pipelines. And then on the egress side, you have, again, match action stages. And then these are conjoined by this shared buffer where the actual switching and queuing scheduling is happening. And therefore, you have a real switch here. Okay. To make this even more generic and programmable, of course, we need a channel to communicate or let this you know, data plane communicate with the control plane. So the control plane, essentially a general purpose CPU, needs a connectivity from this data plane, either dedicated port or PCI channel. And then the control plane should also be able to generate packets back into the uh, data plane. To make this even more programmable and exciting, we can even embed a programmable packet generator and then attach it in front of the uh, incoming or input parser so that this, you know, a, a batch of packets can actually automatically generate it every certain time or upon, you know, detecting a certain uh, event. Of course, you can even add uh, recirculation because some packet processing, you might not be able to fit in this uh, you know, limited number of stages. Some, some, I don't know, some protocols may need a very long sequence of match action uh, execution chain. Then you have to recirculate such kind of packets. So with these kind of capabilities, <coughs> this piece of architecture becomes highly uh, relevant and uh, programmable. So uh, what, what, yeah. Um, yep. I don't know much about chips, yep. but does this yep. amount of programmability you know, in different yeah. environments, as you in your paper, yeah. also can become a bottleneck in your mind. It could introduce some penalty, like the cost of this chip or the size, power consumption can go up slightly, but we believe that that's very marginal these days, and then it'll trend down. And I can share some more data about that offline. So um, now let's talk about the match and action. I talked about this very generic match action <coughs> logic. So what do I mean by match? It's basically a mixture of SRAM and TCAM, where by which you can realize lookup tables or some stateful resources such as counters and meters and something like bloom filters. Right? And what do I mean by the action logic? It's essentially ALUs with a, a fixed number of um, instruction sets, or just instructions. So um, what kind of instructions am I talking about? Of course, standard Boolean and arithmetic operation, yes. plus some networking specific instructions such as add header, remove header, change headers, or some hash generation actions. So these are a complete set of instruction set. Um, so now let's move on to the uh, P4 part, part. So why do we call this protocol independent uh, packet processing because as you have just seen this piece of architecture or an instance of this piece of architecture cannot do anything until it gets programmed. It's a really, really dumb but very fast device and optimized only for packet processing. So you have to program it because this general purpose 
parser, general purpose metric and units, they don't realize any protocol. So you, as the user of this <laughs> device, you have to describe your logical data plan. And that's essentially your P4 program. By the way, thanks for this animation, Lisa. <laughs> okay. So this logic, for example, it's a visual representation of your P4 program, essentially. But it has all the right set of components, for example, a simple set. So layer two boarding followed by IPv4, or V6 lookup, and then finally followed by echo. So if you add just ECMP and lag to this logical data plane, that's essentially what large data centers, Google, Amazon, use in their data centers today. Okay. So now you describe this, and then somebody has to map this logical data plane design to the physical layout. And that's exactly what the compiler will do. So you write this P program, compile it, and then the compiler will find out the best mappings between logical and physical data planes. And then therefore, the compiler has to understand the constraints of this uh, programmable target. Like how many stages are there? How much memory is available? How many ALUs are actually available? And so on. Now, suppose you wanted to change your logical data plane, for example, by introducing a new encapsulation header at layer 2.5. So that's why it comes after L2 and that comes before L3. Then uh, you, you, ch you make these changes, and then you also realize that I've been using this chip maximally even before making this change. So you realize that you have to reduce some of the tables or existing tables. So you decide to reduce IPv6 table to add a new table. And then you recompile it. And then again, compiler will you know, figure out the best mapping for this. Okay. So you, you get this new realization of the data plane. One question. Yeah. Are these uh, units uh, hardware identical? Like, are all of them the same? Exactly. exactly. Same? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're all identical. So they all have, like, say, yeah. hash tables or, like, PCANs and exactly. et yeah. Same amount. Same yeah. Amount. That's the key principle of this piece architecture. Okay. Everything has to be identical. Yeah. So what happened to those packages where you encrypted? Is that going to be your pipeline? If some architecture actually has encryption decryption capability, it can be recruited here. And then you can model it as a logic or functionality available in, at P4, and then you can introduce yes, such a the package has decrypted, you cannot get into any of these pipelines, right? Because that, that's the certain set of a delta time has to be. Yeah, if you're using IPsec, yes. Um, um, Another yeah. question is that uh, there's there's the notion of programming these units yeah. versus the actual scale of these tables. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And typically the scale is maybe a function of time because yeah. when you, when you turn it on, they tend to be small. Yeah. Right. So so in a sense you're saying that you you actually on a running system yeah you know, the, you'll be able to rearrange all of these things based on the how the scale. That is the goal. Theoretically yeah. it's possible to yeah. rearrange all of these resources on the fly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, without impacting the yeah, that's problem. the goal of P4. But how well and how seamlessly can each target support such vision? It's targets, target specific constraints. So out of curiosity, yeah, that you have all these different pipelines based on the purpose of uh, everybody's uh, different uh, requirement. Um, so every single packet comes in, it gets into through these pipelines. Let's say you have to prepare some sort of complicated uh, <coughs> QoS or yeah. traffic management. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes through, let's say, X number of pipelines. Yeah. But these pipelines does really a lot of stuff to get the behavior uh, uh, going. But, you know, the packet is the same flow. They don't have to go through the same thing. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a better idea to, you yeah. know, if the first packet of the flow gets identified through these pipelines, yeah. and the subsequent packet to yeah. just take advantage of the previous result, not, yeah. not going through these pipelines, yeah. right? If you so, want to realize such a design, that's also expressible in P4. So only. You, you, you introduce a connection table, for example, and then if you don't have match, the first packet actually goes through all the tables. And then by, you know, after finishing the first packet, you may actually, you may be able to create a connection entry in the, in the first table so that the subsequent packets can directly handled by the connection table. So such a design is also realizable. Yep. So that means the packet comes in, the first thing is to look for a connection table, yeah. whether it has a record or that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so everything I said sounds a little too magical, right? Sounds good, but all I said is that the compiler will take care of this great thing. So 
In fact, the compiler has a lot of responsibility in this architectural model. And what do I mean by compilation? I, let's go a little more, a little deeper in, in, into that direction. So suppose you have one match action unit here, one of these many identical ones. So what do I mean by this match action unit and what kind of programming do I need or does the compiler need to do? So this is essentially a, uh, an, a visual representation of the architecture presented in the RMT paper. So this match action unit basically is comprised of these kind of functionalities in hardware. This is the uh, packet header vector, PHB, basically the parsed representation or the containers holding these header fields or parsed representation. It comes into this stage and then uh, it also generates this new set of containers. So this is input PHB and output PHB. And uh, some of these PHBs are picked up uh, so that you can use them as key. And then that, that picking up exercise is, of course, done by the crossbar. And then sometimes you, you want to use these fields as a row key. Sometimes you need to hash them to generate a hashed version of the key. And then anyway, you get the key. And then using, use key, using this key, you can match the table. And the table is comprised of SRAM or TCAM. And then uh, the match will lead to an action plus action data or some constant. These are fed into these ALUs. And then the ALUs also use these PHBs, incoming PHBs, as operands. So there are these lines as well. And then finally, these ALUs. This is not a single ALU. This is a, actually a large number of ALUs. And then the ALUs perform these uh, operations all in parallel. And then it generates this new PHB. So what your compiler does is it reads the P4 program, parses it, of course, and then real, basically extracts all the things that the user wants to do. What it does is actually setting up the configuration of all these components. How should I allocate these PHB containers to each of these uh, header fields? How should I configure this crossbar for this particular match action logic so that it can extract the right set of fields to form the right keys? How should I configure this hash generator how should I partition this match table? How should I uh, lot, you know, localize this action and instruction memory? Uh, how should I choose or configure these multiplexers so that they can actually choose the right inputs and generate the right outputs? So this is exactly what the compiler does. So now, this, as I said, this is a visual representation of your P4 program. So let's take a look at the actual P4 program very quickly. So the first thing you need to do when you write your own P program is defining your own headers. These are the actors in your play. Right? So Ethernet, my encapsulation, IPv4, V6, TCP, these are, of course, the headers that I have. So you define, if you were to define Ethernet header, it's as simple as this one. Almost looks like you know, C structure. Header type name. And then you identify all the fields along with their length in bits. And then you can define your my encapsulation header, for example, as you wish. Once you define your headers, you need to interconnect them. So you have to define your um, parse graph. And parse graph is essentially a finite state machine. It starts at a state. And then depending on the state transition conditions, you go to the other states. And then finally, when you go to the you know, correct state, you finish parsing. Parsing. If not, you basically give up. That packet is not parsable. Right? So this representation is very simple. For example, if you start at Ethernet, you extract the Ethernet header, and then based on the Ether type that you have just extracted, transition state. So that's finite state machine abstraction. Very straightforward. Once you have your headers and finite state or parse graph, then you have to define your logical tables. So for example, IPv4 table. Each table, <laughs> logical table, is comprised of two clauses. The first clause is, is what we call read clause. And here, you essentially define the, all the keys. Right? Basically, for example, here, you say that, hey, this destination IP address, I, I want to use this as a lookup key, and I want LPM lookup semantics. And then there could be, of course, exact lookup or prefix lookup or other, other lookup types or range lookups. And then you specify the actions. So each match, each lookup against this table will lead a match or no match, in this, a miss. So when you have a match, 
you you have to specify that uh, hey I want to run either this or these actions one of the n actions for that match and where uh, do these actions come from these are all customizable action user defined actions so you can define your own action here set next up and then uh, when you define your actions your own actions you have to use the basic instruction set which includes modify field, add field, add header, remove header, uh, and so on. So these, these are what we call primitive actions. This is specified and standardized in the P4 spec. And then user-defined actions are built on top of those primitive actions. Yes? Um, are there any kind of assumptions made about actions? Like, for example, could you do multi-path routing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, so, it's, so it's, it's not handled by the primitive actions themselves, it's actually handled by something we call metadata. So the there are two types of metadata, user-defined metadata and intrinsic metadata. So intrinsic metadata is analogically uh, similar to the control registers that you're you're familiar with in the in the you know general purpose CPU world. So these control registers or intrinsic metadata have special meanings to the hardware. So if you change the value of this intrinsic metadata from A to B, the hardware is supposed to do something. For example, in your case, uh, replicating this packet so that it can be forwarded out to multiple ports and so on. Okay. Yep. Uh, does people include like the packet header? When you talk about header, yeah. does it limit only TCP headers or only No, again, people doesn't have any built-in knowledge of particular set of problems. <laughs> so you can go as deep as possible but the target, individual target, may have some physical limitations. For example, one target is that I can parse on all the way up to, I don't know, 512 bytes. Some targets may actually be able to parse the entire packet. But P4 does not dictate any limitations there. So, okay. You're saying yeah. practically the only difference between a header and a payload is whether it, or there may not be an interrupt, but it could be whether you parse If it's well-defined and structured, there's no difference. But sometimes when you look at payload, some applications actually want to do a very elaborate pattern matching, where you can, which you cannot easily express in P4 language. Regular so expression. regular expression evaluation or some hash-based fingerprinting, those things are not defined in P4 yet. Compression. Yeah. Compression. No. P4 is mainly for packet forwarding. But we people actually at least introduced a unified way of sort of borrowing this kind of concept and introduce that into the programmable pipeline. So if your target actually has capability to do encryption, decryption, or regular expression evaluation, you can introduce those functionalities in P4 at least. Yeah. But, but, but isn't yep. that introduce some dependency on I buy a people language on one yep. of this target, one of the other targets, yep. then they have to negotiate. What you're right. You're right. So the more special functions you need, like L7 processing, <laughs> your portability will be lower. But for L2, L3, L4, you'd like to come up with a standard architecture and standard set of functionalities so that you know portability is very well ensured. So once you define your own tables and actions, now finally you have to dictate the order in which you want to apply these tables. So you said, hey, apply L2 table first, and then in my encapsulation, and depending on the packet type, apply IPv4 table or V6 table, and then finally echo table. Okay. Is there a yep. queuing mechanism on the egress of prioritization? Yeah, again, it's controlled by the intrinsic metadata. So if you said, hey, this packet has to be forwarded out to this port, through this particular queue, then you can, you know, there, there is a intrinsic metadata that can encode this kind of method or instructions for you. And I think the question might be for, yeah. for, for handling the queues, like, yeah. like, you know, is this a priority queue or is it yeah. a typo or yeah. you know, various? The, the scheduling mechanisms and queuing disciplines are not programmable in P4 yet. So P4 handles match action and parsing and those kind of things, but you cannot realize programmable scheduler, for example, yet. And the main reason is because, I mean, we could spend time to define such uh, abstractions in P4, but the hardware is not available. We haven't heard of 
real, you know, fully programmable packet scheduler yet. So what's the point of having language go first if you don't have hardware? But if you when have you say, such when hardware, you hardware, then we When you say hardware, then when you mean ASIC? Just? Yeah, the multi-terab EPS ASIC that can do programmable scheduling, we haven't heard of. It's it's a very good research problem, I would say. But presumably it could be done with uh, NPUs or certainly CPUs could program with yeah. programmable scheduler for smart games. Yeah, yeah. But these are terabit, terabit chip. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is just a repetition of the same concept. So let me just skip this one because uh, you have lots of questions. Um, we'll be able to revisit the same kind of concept uh, when I talk about something else. Yes. So uh, you said that you could protect uh, ideas using this language. So if it's compiled, yeah. can it be decompiled? Ah, that's a great question. Um, you could borrow a lot of technologies that the computing industry has developed so far. Right? From binary, how much can you actually deduce? Right? That's the key question. Uh, this is not a fundamentally different problem. So I, I would say that you may have the same kind of capabilities and <coughs> limitations. If I offer a slightly different way of thinking about that, which is that you, after you've compiled, you essentially produce a target target specific executable. So it's really up to the target to decide. I mean, how that how that's encoded on the target itself, as to whether it's possible to reverse engineer that. You can imagine a property of the compiler itself could be to obfuscate, right? Could it could encrypt, and then in a way that only the target itself knows how to decrypt, for example. So that that is a good question. That leads me to another question, which is, do I can can I change this? Can what I can I these? can I can I run one? Can I can I set it up one way and then change it and set it up another way? Yeah. So that I could have multiple instantiation, multiple P4 instantiations. I could load one and then just change my mind, load the other. Yeah. Yeah. You can just upload pre-compiled. So how long does it take to, to make that change? How so long, well, again, assume it's pre yeah. <laughs> I, I would say that it's target specific capability. Some targets may be able to do this without any noticeable traffic disruption. Some targets may need, I don't know, sub-second <clears throat> disruption, which may be acceptable. Some targets, if, oh, I need full reset, I need one minute, whatever. One, one analogy to think of is imagine that the underlying target was an FPGA. That would be a reasonable target. And so you'd be compiling from the P4 program down to some configuration of that FPGA, which may or may not be encrypted, which may or may not be possible to reverse engineer. But you could certainly replace it with a different configuration. And if you obviously want to change its behavior, you write a new P4 program and then compile it. So it's, that's probably a good analogy for how that would work. Thank you. One good question, uh, quick one. Yeah. Um, you've been at Barefoot and you yeah. are um, working on the chip. Do you think excessive programmability is harmful? That introduction of some hardware could be actually beneficial to getting good delay and throughput? Could, yeah. If, so that's why the arriving at the right set of architecture variations is very important. Yeah. But uh, I think understanding the main focus is very important. If you're going to deliver most service packet forwarding, you, you don't really want to introduce encryption decryption in the pipeline. It cannot be the generic part of the act, you know, actions. Yeah. What is the match width of uh, HDMI? Uh, it's um, target specific. P4 does not introduce any limitations. Target may have some limitations. In that case, you will get the compile time error. If you if you ask for a very long width, but the target does not support it, then you'll at least get the compile time error with explicit you know messages so that you can change it. So can yeah. uh, when you're compiling, can I get a a target agnostic uh, binary, and then is that a problem? That's, I think, a little bit of stretch at this point because uh, you might you might need something similar to virtual machines that can run on any targets, right? So that's a little out there, in my opinion. For the foreseeable future, I think the compiler and the compiled outcome will be target specific, but you can always recompile. 
just okay. Just just, just slightly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I have lots of materials. Can I at least move on? Yeah. And then, yeah. So, but um, let's change the gears. Programmability is just a means. It's not the end. So, at the end of the day, what matters is now. Great. What kind of exciting <laughs> we do? So let, let's talk about those kind of things. Okay, so let's start with a simple demo first. Uh, in this demo setup, I'm going to use a P4 program, a reference P4 program. <coughs> it's compiled, and the compiler actually generates two outputs. The first one is switch data plane configuration, and the second one is actually uh, auto-generated <coughs> API. <coughs> so if I had a real chip, this would be the configuration of millions of multiplexers and tables and registers, or maybe hundreds of millions. But now I, I'm not using real chip here. I'm using my software uh, P4 switch. So this is just a generated C code, which again uh, becomes a binary, and then I'm going to run multiple such P4 uh, switches, software switches on my machine. And uh, why do I need to generate a API again using a compiler? The reason is obvious. If you have new tables, you need new access functions, new access APIs to be able to add, delete, or update the entries in the new tables. Therefore, in this P4 world, API is auto-generated. There is no fixed function, hand-generated third-party SDK. You, you, you write your P4 program, and then you own the API as well, because you derive your API. So that's another great benefit. Your API follows you. Okay, so in, in this demo, I'm using this uh, auto-generated API, and then my simple, very simple control plane, basically a Python script, consumes this API to program this uh, P4 switch at runtime. Okay, so I'm going to build this kind of simple network, three switch network. Uh, each switch has its own end host, and then there is a monitor uh, that is just another end host. And I'm going to run uh, this. By the way, I'm using Mininet to be able to do this kind of testing. The default software switch in Mininet is OBS, and I replaced OBS with uh, our P4 switch. So I'm going to run this web server in this Linux uh, namespace, host number one, and I'm going to run my own web client here. And then this will keep you know, downloading the same web page over and over again, and it will have some problems, as I show you. And then to debug such a problem, or to tell whether this problem is actually happening inside a physical network or something else, I decide to collect the actual network information by directly instrumenting the data packets themselves. So essentially, I'm using data packets as probe packets. Every data packet is my probe packet. So when H1, the web server, sends out this web page or a packet, TCP packet, when it arrives at switch number one, switch number one actually instrument this, actually extend this packet, and then it act, adds its own switch ID and then the queuing latency at that particular hop to the packet itself. And then when this packet goes to the next switch, this information is again added up. So when this packet arrives, it actually contains a stack of network instrumentation information, which we call in-band network telemetry information, INT. And the end host stack here in front of hello 3 or virtual switch or the networking stack here can just simply uh, strip this off and then send only the original packet up to the application. And then this information can be used for your own debugging or monitoring. Right? So let's, let me show you this concept very quickly. So I ran this minute script here in this window, and then it'll create the topology and then run the um, visualization of this network. So I said three switch topology, web server running here, web client running here. So page is downloaded this way from H1 to H3 through these two hop path, through switch number one and switch number three. And this is the uh, um, download completion time over the past 30 seconds and then between 0 and 500 milliseconds. So as you can see, there is some performance spikes here. Occasionally, this download completion time hits more than 500 milliseconds, which is ridiculous in this small network. But it's, right? it's, it's, it's not happening all the time. So how, how would you debug this? That's where this INT is kicking in. So let me briefly stop this. So I enabled INT mechanism on all the three switches. And then so this. Queuing latency and switch ID is actually collected in every packet. 
So the, the packets arriving at host number three, now uh, they're actually visualized through this tool. So um, as you can see, each packet actually carries two pieces of information, switch one, switch one string latency and switch three string latency. So switch string three, one string latency is visualized in red dots here, and then switch three string latency is visualized in blue dots. And this is just the time series of all the packets. So each dot has two, two dots, uh, sorry, each packet has two dots. Now, as you can see, every time you see performance problems, user perceived performance problems, you see some pattern here. Blue dots, blue dots going all over, right? So that indicates that, oh, the queuing latency collected at switch number three is occasionally blowing up for whatever reasons. And that actually causes these serious performance problems. And then we all know that when, you, when a TCP connection loses first few packets, SYN or SYNX, it backs up very aggressively and hence the performance can be actually really terrible. If not, you have these small bumps. If you lose one of the packets in the middle, you they actually reduce the congestion window and they have to retransmit. So this perfect correlation is the beauty of in-band network telemetry. You don't need to collect the counters and then try to get the meaning or reason about these counter increases and then try to understand which applications or connections were exactly hit by this problem. But right? that's very you know uh, hard problem to solve. Uh, at the same time, because you have this clear data in the packets, you, you immediately knew that, oh, this is network problem, and this is actually happening at switch number three. I don't need to look at any other places. It's happening at switch number three, so let's zero in on that. OK, so the implementation of in-band network telemetry is roughly some 20 lines of P4 code. So I, I won't be able to go through this, but I just wanted to give you the sense of the, you know, P4 coding that you will have to do. So it's not like C or C++ pro programming. Right? Even with a full you know, reference protocol implementations, you know, almost equivalent feature set is available in fixed function chips, realizing that in P4 takes a few thousands of lines, definitely less than 10,000 lines. Because P4 is very uh, highly abstracted and it's, uh, it's, it's offering the, um, the declarative style language. Uh, Syntax. So if you are more interested in the INP specification or the sample code, take a look at this. Now, we're just starting to scratch the surface here. There are tons of other applications. And then I'm just going to you know, quickly go through some examples that I was able to come up with by talking to you know, other people. For example, by using INP in the network telemetry, now suppose you collect every packet path, right? This packet is delivered to me through this exact physical, you know, sequence of uh, switches, along with the um, the latency, hop level that this packet has observed while being forwarded. Then for every single connection, you can generate, you know, hey, this is a new connection and this is the path and it's hop latency. And then whenever it sees some, some fluctuations or path changes, it usually means something happened inside the network. Why would the packet or connections path change if there's everything was stable, right? So something has happened either through you know, planned maintenance or unplanned events. So you can detect those kind of things. So you can think of doing a lot of exciting things. You can confirm the effect of any network level changes. You can verify or even audit your network behavior. You can quantify the you know, control plane view of the data, the, 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 the routing tables and the, the difference between control plane view and the data plane view. You can also identify connections affected by any maintenance failure. You can detect uh, hop latency increases and identify the victims immediately. You can also think of offloading some of the middle box functionalities, not all, but some of them to the switches themselves. You can embed them. For example, layer for connection load balancing. These days, a lot of people use either appliances or scaled out software-based load balancers. What if you can actually realize this functionality directly in the switch, but every switch, your top of rack switch is the layer for load balancer at the same time, then it's free, right? So if you think about it, the functionality for layer for load balancing is almost there. It's essentially choosing one of the available N options 
based on the hash of a connection ID, basically 524. And then ECMP essentially does that. So the only addition that we need is, unlike ECMP, in the case of the layer four load balancing, you have to remember the chosen next or the chosen dip. Because if it keeps changing, the connection is broken. So once you choose that endpoint, the dip, you have to keep using the same one. So that connection management is, is an, uh, a little bit of a challenge, but with people programmability, you may be able to realize such idea rather easily. And why is this useful? Because if you know people or, uh, or switches do this, it's essentially free. You don't need to burn you know, general purpose CPUs or servers to do these things. Of course, you don't need to employ your uh, layer for load balancing appliances either. And in fact, this people prototype uh, doing this was actually demoed at the last workshop. Custom traffic monitoring and filtering. So essentially, general purpose stateful memory, uh, a generalization of counter or meter, basically set of memory that can be directly accessed by the packets in the data plane. You read, update, and then save it back. So that's the generalization of stateful memory. Combined by custom hashing, gives you an explosion of monitoring ideas. A lot of cool ideas, for example, boom filter based whitelist. Boom filter is trivial if you had you know, general purpose statement of memory and hash, programmable hash. Heavy eater detection using some sketch algorithms, mean, count mean sketch for very easy. Uh, we have also collaborated with researchers at USC and then proposed this idea published at NSDI Flowrader. Um, essentially, this is a, a different way of realizing net flow connection record generation. Conventional NetFlow tries to do too many things in one single box, but if you own your box and if you own the data plane of that box, you can try to limit the amount of CPU cycles and the memory uh, consumed or to do the you know, connection tracking. And so the you can let the switch only generate a half processed connection records so that the switch can actually track a large number of connections. Mm -hmm. And then after that, this half, half processed data can be you know, decoded Actually, you can just spend large amount of computing resources using cloud or your own cluster computing resources and then actually generate the real connection records. So you can let the switches do less, but something do something useful for you and then you can take care of the rest. So revisiting this kind of division of labor between switch and the management system can be done if you have if you own your own data plane. And make source routing for example, when packets are delivered from source to the destination, the packet can always collect the path information, and then the receiving end host or the top of rack switch can keep accumulating this path information, right? So it knows that, oh, I have four paths from this source to me, and then I know the best path for now, best defined in either way, right? Utilization, queuing latency, end to end latency, hop latency, or whatever. And then uh, you can piggyback it back to the source. Hey, currently the best path from you to me is path two, so that the sender side can actually load balance uh, traffic over the right set of path. So you can do that at the packet level, flow level, or flow let level. So these kind of ideas are all realizable in P4. And uh, essentially also uh, one of our collaborators at Princeton have prototyped this and then published this at uh, SOSR last or two weeks ago. Can you reserve any resources in advance? Can, Can I what? reserve any resources? Ah, um, you, I think you could to some extent, but um, we, we haven't gone to that far. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of congestion control ideas. Congestion control is a particularly rich field in networking. Uh, you can try to do uh, intelligent congestion control assistance in the switches directly, such as RCP, XCP, or TechCP. You can also try to do a hybrid mechanism, which is just simply expose more information about the congestion and let end host react to that and then enforce the right fair share. That's what hybrid means. And then, for example, uh, Google published a timely paper last year, CCOM. You can think of doing timely plus plus by not just exposing end to end latency, but you know, one way latency or individual hub level latency along with switch IDs. So you can do a lot better congestion control. Um, congestion control is essentially a little reactive, but you can do proactive control by doing admission control directly at the network level. Right? I know that you know this last up uh, 
you know, output queue is actually congested or desired by these input sources in my network. So I'm going to hand out these tokens only to these guys. So you can essentially realize network level VOQ through this kind of mechanism. So all these ideas are possible. Now, finally, a couple uh, slides about the research problems. So um, there are, I mean, this is just a new field, a huge field just opening up. I, I think this is incredibly rich, especially to you know research uh, and, and um, engineers, researchers and engineers as well. So let's, just let me introduce a, a few high level problems. I don't, of course, these are not well explored at all. And I'm, I'm just doubling one of, or maybe a couple of these, I've just started to double them. So for example, how should P4 evolve? Any real languages will evolve over time, but what's the right direction for P4? So we have in P4 language design group, we have started to think about uh, composability, portability, and uh, language architecture separation issues. So there are some, uh, in, in the latest P4 spec, we identify these problems a little more clearly. So your feedback would be really uh, appreciated. Um, you might also want to take a look at the uh, Anirudh. Um, basically, when you program, when you have PISA style architecture, a lot of parallelization is inevitable to be able to meet this multi terabit BPS. But when you introduce stateful variables there, stateful variables and parallelization do not go very well because stateful variables, read write dependency, cannot be handled in one single clock cycle. So you cannot do read, modify, update in, in a packet transactional fashion when you have multi packets going through this pipeline. So, but compiler may be able to, you know, we, we might be able to in, employ some ideas or some theories developed in the compiler field so that the compiler can actually come up with a better organization of these uh, solutions that meet these certain uh, packet transactional semantics. How do we test the equivalence of two P4 programs before or after compilation? Uh, could he automatically de derive test cases for a P4 program, given a P4 program and maybe a few uh, entries that you might populate in the table later on, can we automatically generate the, the set of packets that exercise all the actions or tables and meet certain properties? That's very useful if you could. Uh, how can we prove the correctness of P4 program? And also what kind of correctness can we prove by looking at the P4 program itself and what kind of properties are not verifiable. Can you even auto-generate P4 programs themselves by you know, deriving these directly from the high-level high networking policies? Your network topology, each device's role, address allocation policies, routing policies, echo policies. Based on that, can you just derive the P4 program? Why not? What novel use cases can we enable? There is, again, this is just, you know, a huge field, but I've just identified only three top level fields because I believe that these are going to be very uh, promising in the new, very near future. For example, advanced network monitoring, analysis, and diagnostics. You can get a lot of, recruit a lot of ideas and then realize them very quickly if you have data plan programmability. Assisting uh, distributed applications by, uh, through in network processing, for example, um, UW researchers published this MOM paper, mostly ordered multicast, and it got the best paper award at NSDI last year. If you can introduce some ordering to multicast cast packet, then Paxos can run much faster at high, you know, high throughput, something like this. Somebody actually wanted to introduce Paxos or upload some of the Paxos computing into the network themselves to achieve the same kind of benefit. Jointly designing the network data plane and the applications running on top of it. For example, switch KB idea, actually this NSDI 16 two weeks ago. So suppose you have a um, memcached like applications running on your network and imagine that the network can actually intelligently tell that given this key, I know that this is already cached on the K server. This is not cached and then I, I have to forward it directly to the one of the backend server. So that can reduce the latency of key value pair lookup significantly. Can we build programmable schedulers, as you mentioned? It's a very important research topic, I would say. And then there are some leads here, you know, PIPO paper, priority in, first out, HANNETS last year, universal packet scale drilling by the Berkeley group this year, and so on. 
P4 development environment. This P4 compiler reference P4 programs, programmable software P4 switch, and test framework. These are all already available under free license, Apache 2.0 license. And then uh, p4.org manages all these things, or contribute, manage all these contributions. So you can actually go try to use this, realize your beautiful ideas right now. Um, the real world hardware targets, a lot of them are actually coming up. Programmable, p4 programmable NICs were demoed and pro being prototyped, probably released very soon by a few companies. So if you go to p4 workshop web pages, you can see their demos. Um, even software switches like OBS and Linux PTF, people are working to come up with P4 programmable version of those. Why? Software is by definition programmable, but why do we need P4? Because there are only so many people who can pack Linux kernel, <clears throat> whereas P4 is much more friendly to network engineers and architects. Okay. So this trend is going to be reversible. Join this party and then uh, contribute this earlier on. Final slide, the benefits of programmability in data plane. You can add new protocols very easily. You can even reduce the complexity. In your network, for example, you're not using MPLS, VLAN, VXLAN, get rid of them, and then it'll lead to more physical resources because layer two table or MPLS table was there even though you didn't use it. Then you can actually tap into that physical resource, increase your IPv4 table, do whatever you want it. And then you can gain greater visibility inside your network at the device level, per packet level. You can enjoy modularity because P4 is a language, right? You can borrow somebody's P4 libraries and then realize your idea very quickly. You can port your ideas. You write P4 program once, compile it over different targets, and hence enjoy different targets capabilities. And finally, you can own your own IP. So essentially what this means is that network is becoming a programmable platform now. And this is not a new trend. This exactly happened in the storage and computing industry a decade or two ago. Right? So this is going to happen in the networking industry. And so that's my ending remark. Finally, mm -hmm. in two months from now, we'll have the third P4 workshop. This is our party. We'll have a full day P4 tutorial on, 20, on the 23rd and then full day workshop on the second day. So. Please join and enjoy this. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're over time for questions. So are you going to be here? Yeah, yeah I'll be here. Yeah, so if anyone yeah. has questions, just ask Chang. Okay, let's thank Chang again. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.